Hello, I'm Carly Biondi. I'm with the Transnational NGO Initiative at uh, Syracuse University. Today I'm here with Barney Talek, uh, the former director of strategy at Oxfam and current INGO consultant. I just want to thank you for being with us today and thank you for letting uh, me interview you. It's a really helpful resource for both faculty and students here. Um, so my first question is, could you give a brief overview of Oxfam and its mission? Okay, so Oxfam exists to eradicate the injustice of poverty, which is quite a big uh, <laughs> statement, uh, and so is there to provide humanitarian uh, relief in cases of huge emergencies, is to help work with communities to, so that they can develop, gain, gain power, uh, gain agency over longer periods of time so that they can have sustainable livelihoods so kids can go to school, they have uh, access to health uh, outcomes, etc. So very rights-based, very rights-based approach. Uh, and it's there to do advocacy, which enables big global transformations down to local transformations in terms of policy, power, ideas, and beliefs. So a whole set of things, <laughs> but the overall aim is to end the injustice of poverty. Okay, thank you. Um, so this week you're here with us for a very special reason. Yep. You're our TNGO fellow. Um, can you explain your research topic so, uh, I work with many INGOs and certainly with Oxfam over the years, uh, looking at obviously strategy and transformation. How are these organizations trying to change themselves in order to be more fit to deliver their missions and their strategies? So, there are two ways of looking at this particular uh, topic. One is to look at INGOs as they are now and how they want to change over the next five to ten years in order to deliver their current strategies in the current uh, world with a, that near-term view. I also uh, am enjoying being here and looking at the question and have asked the research team to answer the question. If you were looking at it from a much further out perspective, say 2050, and you imagined a world in which you either didn't need uh, northern INGOs or INGOs had got smaller or even disappeared, what would the legacy be that those organizations would like to have left uh, over the period from now until 2050? So a different way of looking at essentially the same question. Okay. And in what ways have Oxfam and other INGOs uh, worked to evolve over the years, especially in the context of shifting landscape as we see globally? So if you think about the sort of long-term history mm -hmm. of the INGOs, many of them set up either in the early part of the 20th century, a lot uh, after, during or after the Second World War. Um, they often started as very humanitarian relief organizations, so either providing response in, in emergencies or you know, some, some longer-term development to help communities be resilient in the case of emergencies. And so what's happened over the, the decades is individual uh, INGOs or individual NGOs, let's be clear, individual NGOs have developed into other sorts of programming, other ways to achieve the mission, which look not just at the causes, but look more at the symptoms. And as a consequence of that, they've moved from usually national bodies into much more international bodies and now are trying to become global bodies. And what I mean by that is, instead of being a single national body working, say, uh, in multiple countries in the global south, but based in a single country in the global north. They've begun, uh, they began certainly in the 70s, 80s, 90s, becoming either confederations or much stronger federations with lots of members in different countries so that they could act more as a coherent whole with more, bring together more resources to their particular missions. So that's been how they've developed, driven by how they see the, the best way to achieve their mission with this you know, changing theory, changing new theories of change that emerge every now and again, and then how they have their organizational form change in order to deliver those new missions. Okay. And my last question, as a leader of the international, internationally active humanitarian organization, what would be the three most pressing 
issues related to humanitarian action that you see today? So there's there's more than three. <laughs> <laughs> so one is just you know the the environment in which we operate, uh, you know, climate change, civil mm -hmm. wars, other other crises, man-made or environmental. So just the volume of those and climate change in particular is creating many many more uh, environment-related emergencies. So that's that's the context, if you like. In order to address those emergencies, I think the pressing issues range from, uh, first and foremost, just having the political will. Do, does the world have the political will to deal either with climate change or to create a humanitarian system that responds to those crises, basically to the people who are, who are suffering in those particular issues? So that's sort of pure humanitarian. In terms of the development and advocacy space trying to deal with those symptoms, uh, sorry, deal with the causes rather than the symptoms. Uh, again, an element of political will. Uh, one of the big pressing issues at the moment is the space for civil society to operate and for organisations, NGOs, NGOs, civil society organisations, to either operate and do what they do or to challenge the power that, that exists in those countries because poverty and injustice is almost always a consequence of a power imbalance, whether that's gender equality in the household through to you know, d divisions between groups within a country through to divisions between countries within a continent and so on. Okay. Well, that was two. Yeah. Do you want to give us the last one or is, um, do you think that about covers it? Uh, mostly covers it. Um, I mean, there's lots of interesting challenges, <laughs> opportunities that exist, which are less less, uh, I suppose, less tangible than that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of, the, some of the opportunities that exist are around, obviously, you know, changes in technology, certainly people uh, identifying more as global citizens, particularly mm -hmm. in the global south. So there's, there's lots of positive uh, opportunities there, but there are also, you know, other challenges in terms of planetary boundaries, that's a massive challenge. Access to resources, who stewards resources, who owns resources. And I suppose the overall um, value set, which uh, you know, if you think about what came out of the Second World War, a very rights-based approach, you know, the idea of universal human rights, that sometimes is growing, that acceptance of that, and sometimes it's decreasing, mm -hmm. which it relates back to the civil society space problem. Okay, well, thank you very much for being with us.